welcome to the real world industry analysis for Ashworth Lee. That's the pre-scene company for the operational case study exam of May 2017. And in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the industry in which the company operates, and that's the automotive industry. This video uses the industry analysis document, which is a product you can buy. You go to the Astranti website and get access to this there. And it's a, a document of 100 pages that goes into depth analyzing the actual car industry, the different aspects of it, and importantly, Ashworth Lee's role within that. And one of the best things about this analysis is that we have 25 industry examples, and those are examples of things, issues, things that are happening in the car industry themselves that are or may be in some way applicable to Ashworth Lee and other kind of things that could come up in the exam. And if they do, what you have then is an example where you can literally take real life information and statistics and use that in a paragraph in your exam and get yourself some really good marks. Okay, so let's get started. So we're going to very briefly take a look at the history of the automotive industry. So it's obviously one of the biggest in the world and it's by in terms of revenue one of the most important economic sectors. 19,780,583 vehicles were produced in 2015 and in that same year the size of the global automotive supply market was 620 billion euros so it's a massive industry very important very big very powerful so the history actually goes back quite a long way as you can see here if we go back to the very very early days of cars in the sort of early 1800s 1807 here we have the first car powered by an internal combustion engine which was actually fueled by hydrogen and that's you know you're talking over 200 years ago there but in the time since cars have developed a hell of a lot and it's really not until the early or the very late 18th, 1800s, very early 1900s, that you start getting cars in their modern form. So in 1886 here, we find that Carl Benz developed a petrol gasoline powered automobile. And this is considered to be the first production vehicle as Benz made several other identical copies. So you have 1886, the very first production vehicle cars with the intention of making them as a as a as a item or as a product to be sold to customers rather than just uh, an interesting kind of engineering um, venture. So from that point in the late 1800s, the industry grew and grew and grew, and we go through very various, various different eras here that have their own specific names. And you have the very early days when people are still figuring out how to get engines together and sort it all out from that perspective, and then roughly. And around sort of the uh, the sort of later part of the early 1900s, you start getting cars that are produced on a larger, more mass scale, and they're designed to be used by consumers. And safety issues are coming into it as well. And you have the vintage era from the end of the Second World War up until the economic crash in the late 20s. And really, cars in their modern shape, the way that we understand them and the way that they're marketed and produced, that really starts gaining ground from the 1930s onward. And you start to get cars that actually look a little bit more like the cars we get these days in the post-war era from the mid-40s after the Second World War up until 1990. That's when a lot of the major innovations in terms of car design were made. And that's the way, those are the, the routes that we followed for where to get where we are today with the car industry. And this includes things like having running boards instead of fenders. So you have sort of a more inclusive integrated car that seems like a whole thing with panels. Throughout the 50s, the engine power was more and more uh, powerful. Cars became more powerful. They could do more, they could go further. And you had cars specifically started to be uh, aimed at certain demographics. So you had family cars or you had sports cars and things like that as well. By the 60s, you started to get companies that had already kind of established themselves as the main players. So in the USA, you had the big three, which was General Motors, Ford and Chrysler. And they were the big three in the 60s. And each of those actually still remain very powerful and big companies today. 
Moving on, we get to the modern era, and that is essentially defined as the previous 25 years. So that takes us back to the late 80s, early 90s. And the major developments we've seen in the last 25 years include using computers more and more, so computer-aided design, not only in the cars themselves, but in the way cars are made, but you have increasing use of electronics for the engine and for entertainment systems in the cars. You have all-wheel drives and different ways of, you know, the adoption of diesel engines, fuel injections, etc., etc. Um, body styles have changed too in the modern era, and um, there are three main kinds. The hatchback, sedan, sports utility vehicle, they all dominate the market. A sports utility vehicle, also known as an SUV, and these are the most popular kind of cars that we see in the market these days. Okay, so a very brief look at the history there, but let's think about why that matters for Ashworth Lee. So cars in the most basic form have been around for about 200 years, but really the car industry has only been around for about 130 years. Ashworth Lee have actually been around since the early part of the 20th century, which means they've been around for most of this history, and they've seen a lot of the changes and developments that the car industry have been through themselves. So they're in a good position to be able to uh, not only are they established, but they, they kind of understand the industry and they know how to roll with it in order to stay relevant. There are a few significant events in their history that we might want to take note of. So one is that the business almost almost failed approximately 30 years ago in around about the mid-80s due to a lack of new models um, being developed and released. And that that in that instance, they were actually saved by a company, DOM, another car manufacturer, who bought a 60% stake and completely sort of made some major changes to the company, invested in research and development, and new cars were produced, which eventually brought Ashworth Lee back into the running. So more recently, DOM have actually reduced their stake to only 15%. The now one of the bigger investors is the investment group, which owns 45%, and the original owners, the um, relatives of the founders of the company 100 years ago hold 40 percent all that remains for me to say is thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed it i hope you got something out of it and i'll just take a few moments of your time if i could to just tell you about some of the other case studies case study materials that we offer so one of the things is a study text now this is a study text specifically aimed at the case study and we have one for each level so we have an operational management and strategic level one and they're designed to help you pass the study they're in two halves the first half is exam tips and this exam strategy and advice on how to answer questions and all the really useful kind of tips that you need going into these exams and how to prepare for them and then the second half the second part of those is a recap of the key theory that always comes up in the case studies again and again so those are really useful really valuable thing that you can get uh, those are available online and you can get there an actual textbook, a print physical textbook for the old fashioned among you who like to do it that way still. Uh, we also have course videos that correspond uh, with that study text as well. So we have a series of really nicely well produced, well done videos uh, in which we basically take you through exactly what's involved in the case study and how you can uh, spend your time preparing for it to ensure that you get really good marks it's really really great um, series of videos there we've got the pre-scene analysis which the video you just watched is an example of the pre-scene analysis and there'll be several more videos just like that where we look at every every tiny detail of the pre-scene and we relate it back to the the p1 or f1 or e1 and we relate it to real life scenarios relate it to uh, actual business and analysis tools and we give you the um, what we expect to be the top 10 issues. Another thing that we do is slightly different is the industry analysis and that is a really, this is a really great document in which we basically cover everything um, that's relevant to the industry for the particular business that we're looking at and it goes from the history through to the, the customers and suppliers and the market and how the market has functioned and the history of that and we've got statistics in there and diagrams and it's full of information it's so so useful and at the end of that pack we also have 25 actual industry examples so real life things that have happened in that industry that um, kind of examples of things that might actually happen to this uh, to the company 
in the exam. So it gives you a sense of the kind of things that are going on in the industry and how real life businesses in that industry have coped with it. We have mock exams, which are, if you were gonna pick any one of these to do, I would suggest it was the mock exams because nothing prepares you for the exam more than actually sitting a mock exam. And if I were if I were a student taking this, I would certainly put mock exams at the top of my list, along with marking and feedback. Now, our mock exams are actually um, designed to match the way that the actual SEMA exams are, so you can sit them on your laptop and they'll be timed and automatic, and they are as close as you are gonna get to the real thing. And you can get marking and feedback on that as well, which is probably the most invalu uh, valuable thing you could probably get to get specific feedback from uh, from a marker who is, deals with this exam four times a year. That's the best way for you to improve your uh, your ability to pass this exam uh, as quickly as possible. We also have a masterclass. So as an online company, we hold an online masterclass, which you can sign up for. And it's a, um, a day over, over the weekend. We do the Saturday and a Sunday and it's, it's a full day's worth of a, we have an expert who, who takes an online seminar and we go through everything um, specific to that case study that you can do to get prepared for the exam. And we cover all sorts and it's very, very popular among students who like a one-on-one -on -one kind of classroom environment um, in, an online, in an online situation. We also offer pass guarantee. So if you do, uh, if you're unlucky enough to not uh, pass your exam the first time round, then there's no worries because we give you the option. If you if you choose a pass guarantee option, then if, as long as you hit all the basic, all the all the minimum requirements that we ask, and you don't pass, then you get uh, you get access to our materials for the next sitting, uh, completely free of charge. So there's there's something that we're doing to try and to try and get you. Um, hopefully, if you if you signed up to our course and you do everything that we say you should do, then you probably will pass first time. That tends to be the way it goes. But if you should be unfortunate, if it's a particularly tough exam, then we'll let you have another go um, for free. So that's it. Thanks again for watching. Remember, my name is James. You can find me on Facebook, James Nutting Astranti, where I'll be posting all sorts of information about the upcoming exam in February. Make sure you check that out. Um, because there's always something to talk about with regards to that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.